Hi, friends. Welcome to Foggy Oak Fairy Tales, a stories podcast for all ages, where we tell farm stories from real life happenings on Foggy Oak Farm, as well as fantasy tales to spark both learning and imagination. I'm so glad you're here. This week, we have a story about mermaids. Rowan and Rosalie live on a farm in Canada, several hours from the ocean, but they've always been drawn to it, and one day their mother takes them to visit their mysterious Aunt Maya, who lives in a cottage by the sea in Nova Scotia. It turns out Aunt Maya is an honorary mermaid, and so are they, at least if they can pass the tests of the sea talkers, which is another word for mermaids and earn their tails. Join us as they try to complete their first test in a kelp forest filled with sea urchins, otters, and even a great white shark. Rowan and Rosalie's aunt lived by the sea. She had lived in a house near the beach for as long as anyone could remember. But Rowan and Rosalie had never been to visit. You're too young. Let's wait until you're older, their mother said. When they asked why, she never really answered. Oh, being by the ocean, it's fun, but dangerous, you know. She'd wave her hand vaguely, smile, and change the subject. So they were both surprised when school let out for the summer, and their mother announced that they were going to visit their Aunt Maya in Nova Scotia. What's more, their parents weren't coming with them for the visit. They'd drive the kids there the following weekend and then head back home to take care of the farm while the kids had time with their aunt and the ocean. They spent the week in a blur of excitement, finding all their swimming gear, packing and unpacking and repacking their bags, debating what would be the most fun part about the trip. They already loved the ocean from many visits to other places with their father, And they already loved Aunt Maya from her many visits to the farm. So this was bringing together the absolute best of both worlds as far as they were concerned. The day of the drive finally came. They loaded up with snacks, said goodbye to their dad who had decided to stay home to care for a sick sheep, and drove off with their mother to find Aunt Maya. You're old enough to visit now, but you must listen to your aunt and do as she says, especially around the sea. Their mother cautioned them as they drove. The sea by her home is unpredictable and wild. She'll help you stay safe and have fun. The warning barely registered with them through their excitement. And while the drive felt like it took an eternity, as all road trips do when you're really excited about the destination, they eventually began to smell the salt on the air and feel the humidity of an ocean breeze. They turned off a main road onto a winding gravel drive that took them through a forest of brooding pine trees. The driveway slowly widened into a welcoming and neatly kept courtyard. Ahead lay a snug and cheerfully painted yellow cottage with creamy white trim, surrounded by blooming lilac bushes and a veritable rainbow of flowers that spilled in reckless abandon from their beds. Beyond the cottage sprawled the ocean a short walk down a well-worn path to a sandy beach. And in the entrance stood Aunt Maya, arms spread in welcome and a delighted smile across her curiously ageless face. Welcome, children! Welcome, sister! She called to them as they all ran toward one another and were swept into Maya's tight embrace. She released them and hustled them all before her to a patio overlooking the sea, where she had already set up a delightful repast of bread and cheese and fruit and meats. Rowan and Rosalie feasted on the mid-afternoon meal, enjoying the sea breeze, the sun on their faces, and the cold glasses of lemonade that Maya kept filled from her giant pitcher on the table. Between the food and the lively conversation, catching her up on their lives, and hearing about what Maya had been up to, they were delightfully entertained. Once they had stuffed themselves so full they were worried their bellies might explode, Maya and their mother took them back to the car to grab their suitcases. Then Maya led them into the cozy cottage, which was filled with rich wood trim, golden sunlight, and a sitting room with plumply cushioned yet welcomingly shabby couches that practically begged to be jumped on and snuggled into. 
Maya led them up a narrow staircase off the sitting room and up to a small bedroom overlooking the ocean. Twin beds flanked the open window and the sea breeze swirled enticingly through the room. The air held a scent of more than just the ocean. It smelled like the promise of something secret, something new. The kids set their bags down and dashed back downstairs to say goodbye to their mother, who was driving back to the farm that afternoon. As they embraced her, she said to them, Remember, listen to your aunt, have fun, make memories, and come back to me. Mom, you're coming back for us next week, Rowan laughed. Yes, well, hmm. she laughed a little and gave them both one more squeeze before standing up to say goodbye to their aunt. Have a safe drive back, Maya said to her sister, hugging her tight. Make sure they come back, their mother said, giving Maya a meaningful look. Oh, don't worry so much. Go on. And their mother got in the car, rolled down the window, and waved goodbye as she pulled away down the long, winding driveway, disappearing gradually into the forest. Now, kids, there's plenty of daylight left. Let's go to the beach, Maya exclaimed as she turned to them, clapping her hands in excitement. Go get your suits on and we'll be off. Both kids whooped in excitement and surged towards the house. They got ready in no time and met their aunt at the head of the path leading down to the beach. The three of them set off down the path, the kids almost trembling with anticipation at getting into the waves. When they reached the beach, Maya gave them both a serious look. There's a reason you haven't been to visit me yet, and there's a reason why your mother never took you to the ocean herself. She turned to look out at the waves. In a flash, both children realized this was true— though they'd never connected the dots before. Aunt Maya had never, never come to the sea with them, and what's more, neither had their mother. They had always thought it was just because of the farm. But was it? Maya took what seemed like a deep, steadying breath and resumed. Your mother and I could never figure out exactly how to tell you, so we decided that I would show you. Rowan, Rosalie, your mother and I... And we suspect you are honorary sea talkers, what you might have heard called mermaids. The kids started to laugh, but then saw she was serious. Aunt Maya, what? Rowan started to ask, but stumbled to a stop as she walked straight ahead into the water. Once she got out past her waist, she held her hands above her head, closed her eyes, and dove into an oncoming wave. Both kids looked for her, but saw nothing. They ran closer to the water, a bit worried, when she suddenly appeared in the shallower water by the beach, and instead of legs, she had a tail. They both ran into the water toward their aunt. Aunt Maya, is that real? How? Rosalie exclaimed. Maya smiled and lifted her tail towards them in an invitation to touch. It felt exactly like a fish's body. Smooth in one direction, slimy, rough if you ran your hand in the direction opposite the scales. And her tail was lovely, a shimmering silver with flecks of gold, with a huge fin at the end, so thin it was nearly transparent. When Rosalie ran her finger along the fin, her aunt burst out into a cackle. (laughs) Rosalie, that tickles! She managed around her laughter as she splashed her tail into the water, spraying Rosalie in the process. As for how, the short version is your mother and I spend every summer here, in this cottage by this stretch of ocean. When we were teenagers, we'd be in the sea most days, almost all day, and one day we found a striped dolphin and her baby tangled in a net near the shore, unable to get free. We untangled her and the calf and released them back into the waves. We had just started swimming back to shore when a giant swell overtook us. We were disoriented and separated, and both your mother and I inhaled seawater when we were thrown under. The dolphins came back to us to try to help, but we had swallowed too much water, and they were weak from being caught in the net. I heard yelling, and I heard voices talking, and then I could breathe again. Your mother said it was the same for her. The dolphins had called the sea talkers, and they had saved us by transforming us into mermaids. Once we realized we could breathe, they explained what they had done. We were honorary sea talkers, mermaids. 
now, it's not something they grant very often. Our children and descendants would have a chance to become sea talkers too, so it's a serious gift. And the ocean is dangerous, even for a mermaid. And for us honorary sea talkers, it can be very hard to leave the ocean once we transform. And that has its own dangers. Maya looked at them with sadness and love in her eyes. That's why we waited until you were older. We knew we had to tell you, but we weren't ready. Rowan and Rosalie had a thousand questions that were about to come tumbling out when they saw them. Out in the deeper waters, three figures had appeared, heads and shoulders floating above the waves. It was hard to see the details clearly, but each being was distinct. One had light blue skin that glittered in the sunlight, with a wild tangle of thick green hair that looked like the kelp that grew in a sea forest nearby. Another had deep blue skin and a writhing cascade of hair that looked like the arms of an octopus. The hair rippled through colors and patterns constantly. One moment it was bright red like a coral, the next it was a deep mottled golden brown like the ocean floor. It was hard to look at it for too long. The third had skin the color of absolute darkness, the kind of darkness you experience when you close your eyes and there are no lights around. That sea talker had short, pale, white hair that looked like the bristles of a yeti crab. It's time, Maya, the seaweed-haired member of the trio called. I know, I know, they're coming, Maya yelled over the waves. Listen, kids, this time... I can help you transform. You'll have to figure out the right way for you on your own in the future. She scooped seawater into her hands and threw it into their faces. When they jumped back a bit in surprise, she swiped their legs out from under them with her tail, and they both dropped under the water like rocks, gasps of surprise bubbling out of their mouths as they went. The surprise must have unlocked something deep within them. Both kids felt their bodies transforming. Suddenly, they weren't gasping out bubbles under the water. They were breathing comfortably through gills that emerged on their torsos. And they weren't tumbling all about in the rolling waves, because they too had sprouted silver tails where their legs would normally be. They looked at one another under the water in awe. Some kind of film had developed over their eyes so that the ocean water didn't sting and they could see clearly in the rolling waves. Maya appeared in front of them and hugged them tightly. I have to leave you kids. This part of becoming an honorary mermaid, you have to do together with your guides. Remember your mother and me and come back to us. Their aunt didn't wait for them to respond. She swam quickly away. Before either Rowan or Rosalie could call out to her to come back, the seaweed-haired mermaid was there, looking at them appraisingly. Hello, children, they heard. To their ears, the sea talker's voice sounded something like whale calls, But in their minds, they understood the words behind the tones, along with a sense of welcome. I am the first of your guides. To become honorary sea talkers like your aunt and your mother, you'll need to learn with us and show that you are committed to preserving the well-being and wonder of the ocean. Your blood may carry our magic, but only your actions can ensure it will work for you. Each of your guides represent a different part of the ocean, what you humans call zones. I'm Alba, from the Sunlight Zone. Come along with me to the location of your first test. Both children were too stunned to manage a verbal response. Rowan and Rosalie thought they nodded, or they must have done something to indicate they agreed, because the seaweed-haired mermaid made a graceful turn in the water and began swimming away. Both kids struggled to flip their tails. They found they had a natural sense for what should happen and how they should move, but that didn't translate to their movements right away. They both managed an awkward fanning motion with their new tails and fins that allowed them to go in the right direction at a bit of a distance behind the mermaid as they tried to figure out how to move. Even as they worked out the mechanics, they made good time. Although they hadn't noticed they were inhaling any water, both kids could tell that the smell of the water changed as they followed the mermaid. It began to have a faint smell of iodine, like the smell they associated with seaweed. 
The kids soon saw why. The sea talker was taking them to the nearby kelp forest. The dense forest was made up of tall brown seaweed that grew everywhere across a great span of ocean. The children knew from school and from their own time in the ocean that kelp forests are incredibly dynamic ecosystems, filled with life of every variety, and it appeared they were going to experience that firsthand. As they drew nearer to the forest, which undulated in the currents of the water, their guide stopped and turned back to them. I'm not allowed to explain everything to you now, or even to answer questions at this point. I know from talking to your aunt that you don't know much. Do your best to learn and earn your tales. The answer is in this forest. And with a turn and a flip of her tail, she disappeared into the kelp. Unsure what else to do, the two kids swam in the direction she had gone, into the waving kelp. Life was everywhere. The sunlight filtered down through the leaves of the kelp, turning them an almost golden yellow. Schools of small fish swirled here. There a seal darted past. On the seafloor, a veritable carpet of sea urchins munched on the kelp in a spiky herd. Unsure exactly where they were, both kids swam to the surface to see if they could orient themselves. The kelp forest stretched out around them, and they did not recognize the shoreline. They must indeed have come far, quickly. Rosalie let out a squeak of surprise when she turned her head and saw a baby sea otter tangled in the kelp at the surface next to her. Both she and Rowan had heard that sea otters wrapped themselves and their babies in kelp at night to keep them from floating away, and that mothers sometimes also would leave their babies in kelp when they went out to find food. But it was one thing to hear that and another thing to see this in action. Rowan, look, it's so cute, she gasped, reaching out a hand to gently stroke the sleeping baby's head. Rosalie, it is cute, but should we maybe talk about the bigger issue we have going on here? Rowan asked. Oh, you mean the mermaids? Or you mean how we apparently are mermaids too? Rosalie said as she continued stroking the baby's fur. How about that mom is apparently a mermaid and she's refused to come to the ocean with us our entire lives? This is all just too fantastic to be real. And yet, Rosalie, whenever we were in the ocean growing up, I felt something, some kind of connection, you know? I never wanted to get out of the water. Dad would have to make us get out, remember? One time, You even told him you'd been talking to a dolphin. Well, I don't remember that exactly, but I do remember that feeling. It's like this, I don't know, Rowan, this feels right, she finished, gesturing down towards her tail in the water. Look, it seems like we're being tested right now, so maybe we should get through our test and then ask our questions, assuming we like being honorary mermaids, which I think we do. Okay, let's figure this out then. Questions later. What could a test be in a place like this? Both started to look around again when Rowan noticed that the baby otter was no longer floating by Rosalie's head. Had they moved that much, he looked all around and thought he saw a bundle that could be that baby otter floating away near the edge of the kelp forest. How did that happen? Hey, Rosalie, I don't see the baby otter anymore. Do you? Rowan asked to be sure. Oh my gosh, no, I don't. Where could it be? Maybe we should try to find it. I think the mom wanted it to stay here. Do you think that bundle way over there could be it? He asked. I don't know, but you're right. We should go check. What if it got loose and it's floating out to sea? Rosalie sounded worried. They both were worried. The kids dove under the water and swam together towards the bobbing bundle, which by now had reached the edge of the kelp forest. As they neared the end of the kelp, they saw a dark shape lurking. Drawing closer, it became clear that a fearsome-looking great white shark was prowling just outside the forest. Both children surfaced immediately to see if that bundle was indeed the baby before they swam out to interact with a shark if they didn't have to. It was. We can't let that shark get the baby otter, Rosalie exclaimed and looked towards the bobbing bundle. Indeed, the baby had awoken and was beginning to let out distressed cries. 
Oh, baby, hold on, Rowan called to it. They both dove under to find the stalks of the kelp that were holding the baby and came face to face with the shark, which had come to investigate the cries. Both kids screamed involuntarily. It was big. It was scary. But nonetheless, they both grabbed onto the otter's kelp stalks and pushed the baby otter further into the forest and away from the shark. Shark, that baby otter is not food, and neither are we, Rosalie squeaked, adding the last for good measure. The great white tilted its head and regarded them with its dark eyes. I don't even eat otters. I was just curious. You're lucky I don't eat mermaids either, it said in an offended tone. The shark gave a huff and turned and swam away. Rowan and Rosalie were shaking with the aftershock of that encounter, but they found the baby's kelp stalks again and swam with it back to its earlier location. Okay, baby, what happened here anyway? Rosalie asked. She pulled up one of the kelp stalks and found the answer. It had been severed from its holdfast. Oh, Rowan, these sea urchins, they must have been working on this baby's nest. Remember how we saw all of them earlier? They both took a quick look under the water. Indeed, a large group of the spiky creatures were working together on a kelp strand nearby. I don't want to just wrap this baby in other kelp if the sea urchins are eating the kelp stalks away right here, Rowan said. Let's stay until the mom comes back, and then we can sort out what to do to help. Yeah, that sounds good, Rosalie agreed. They both settled in for a wait, using the time to practice moving their tails and taking turns trying to make quick somersaults and darts through the forest as they learned how to better manipulate their fins. The baby seemed too young to understand them or to speak back to them, but they talked to it reassuringly and it settled back down to sleep with some gentle head strokes from whichever kid was watching it at the moment to assist. After maybe half an hour of this, they saw an otter swimming towards them, looking alarmed by their presence. What's going on? Is my baby okay? The otter called. Clearly the mother had returned. Yes, your baby's just fine, Rowan reassured her. It looks like that herd of urchins ate through the holdfast on your baby's kelp bed, and he was drifting out into the ocean. We brought him back, and he's been sleeping since then. Thank you for helping us, the mother otter cried, touching her nose to both of theirs, and then unwrapping her baby for a tummy cuddle. I hadn't realized those urchins were so close. The baby snuggled into its mother and began nursing. What the kids hadn't realized was... When her nose touched each of theirs, they felt a strange tickling sensation running along their tails. Looking down, they both saw that their tails and fins now sported shining specks the same color as the golden green and yellow of the kelp in the sunlight. Well done, children! Alba cheered as she emerged from a nearby strand of kelp. You've done it. You've helped without expectation of reward. You stood up to something you were naturally afraid of, and you cared for the baby until its mother was safely returned. There are always creatures in need, and you've shown that you can see the need and work to address it. There's, of course, a lot more to the Sunlight Zone to learn over time, but you've passed your first test in the first layer of the ocean. Thank you, Alba, Rowan exclaimed. Does that mean the Twilight Zone is next? Rosalie asked. Oh, yes, Alba said. Hesper will be along momentarily to take you to the next part of your trial. I know you said you weren't allowed to answer questions before, but can you now? Rosalie asked hopefully. I think you've earned the answers to one question each, Alba replied warmly. Go ahead, Rosalie, Rowan said. You ask first. If our mother is an honorary sea talker, too, why does she never go to the ocean? Do you know? Rosalie queried. Technically, that's two questions, but very well. I do know. Your mother was a great friend, in fact. Alba sighed. I think I heard your aunt mention that honorary sea talkers sometimes have a hard time leaving the sea, going back to life on land. The kids nodded. 
Aunt Maya had warned them about that in their brief conversation before she released them to Alba's first test. Well, your mother was one such. At first, it was fine. She'd visit us during the day and return home with your aunt at night. But gradually, it became harder for her to leave. She wanted to stay. And we wouldn't have minded. She was welcome to stay with us. But your father was devastated. Caring for both of them, your aunt begged your mother to return one last time to at least say goodbye. My understanding is that when she transformed back into her human self, she realized what had almost happened. Your aunt told me she vowed never to go into the ocean again for fear that it would take her away forever and make her forget her family. And then she and your father moved inland to a farm so that she wouldn't be tempted. I had hoped she might at least come and say hello today when she dropped the two of you off, but I suppose it was hard enough to even do that. Alba looked at the children sadly. I'm glad she is letting you try to earn your tales with us. At least the friendship I had with her can live on in you. She wrapped an arm around each of the kids and gave them a squeeze. We'll talk to her, Rosalie vowed. If we earn our tails, we'll talk to her and we'll help her so that she can come back. You know, child, I believe you will. Alba gave them one last squeeze and then motioned for them to follow her. She led them out of the kelp forest and into the open ocean, where, a bit further out, they saw the constantly changing, writhing mass of hair of the sea talker they now knew was Hesper. Well met and good fortune on your next test in the twilight zone, Rowan and Rosalie. I will see you at the end. Alba motioned them towards Hesper, gave a wave, and then slapped her fin down on the water in a goodbye splash as she swam back toward the forest. Rowan and Rosalie swam forward to face their next test, hopeful and excited to explore and learn and help. That's it for this week, but stay tuned for how Rowan and Rosalie tackle the next part of their journey to becoming honorary mermaids in the twilight zone of the ocean with help from their mysterious mermaid guide, Hesper. Thanks to my daughter, Rory, for requesting a story about mermaids for her birthday. Happy birthday, Rory. I love you. Remember, you're part of the story, too. What did you think of this story? What did you imagine when you were listening? We'd love to hear your part of the story. If you and your grown-up want, you can share your thoughts or a picture you drew with our Foggy Oak podcast family. You might find it easiest to share with us on Facebook at Foggy Oak Farm, but we have lots of options on our website, foggyoakfairytales.com. You can also check out pictures from the farm and learn more about us. Thanks for being part of the story, and I hope you'll join us next week.